The War of 1812 is probably one of the most fascinating periods of American history. Uh, our young republic was new. Uh, it wasn't going very well by 1812. Uh, the states weren't working together very well. Some of the New England states had already attempted to secede. Um, those who came across the Appalachians to settle in this area were generally looking for freedom from government, uh, from the influence of people in the east. And so they weren't working together very well with people uh, along the east coast at all. Um, we were a small power. We didn't have, our government didn't have many resources for um, the army. President Jefferson intentionally chose to downsize the army. Uh, and after the experience of the Revolutionary War, uh, when they had to house British soldiers and they, they caused such a, a problem in the villages, uh, most settlers decided they didn't want a large standing army. And uh, President Jefferson thought that his opponents had stacked the army against his party. And so he intentionally downsized the army, which made us very weak and vulnerable uh, by, by 1812. 1812, the large powers in the world, as you know, were France and Britain, and they were fighting each other. Napoleon was attempting to take over the world, and, and Britain was trying to stop him. And some people in the American government uh, thought that would be a good opportunity while the big powers were fighting each other that maybe uh, they could e exercise their authority and, and get some independence here locally. Of course, there were lots of reasons for the War of 1812. Uh, the fact that the British and, and French were both impressing our soldiers on the high seas uh, was a big problem that, that kind of stunned national pride and, and people uh, wanted to re rebel against that. Uh, also, the British were working through American Indians. Um, often they didn't want to send British soldiers to our soil and incur the expense of housing them. And so they would find friendly allies, maybe in the creeks or some of the tribes in the north, and ask them to attack the settlements here to keep us from going west across the Mississippi River because they thought if they could contain us long enough for them to defeat Napoleon, they would eventually be able to come back and claim American soil. And, and they found some um, uh, plans that the British had for invading uh, the, the continent from uh, New Orleans, going up to control the Mississippi River, all the traffic on the Mississippi River. So if they control New Orleans from the south and then Canada from the north, in a kind of a pincer movement, they would be able to then move against the Americans, contain them, and maybe push us back across the Appalachians and, and control most of the continent again. So that was the plan that some in Britain had and what, what we were up against in 1812. But our topic tonight really is Franklin, the Natchez Trace, Andrew Jackson, and the role that they played in the War of 1812. In 1812, Franklin was really on the edge of the American civilization. You know, the continent, the settlement of the continent came down pretty much to Franklin, a little bit farther south, but that was about it. And, and south of here, was Chickasaw Territory and Choctaw Territory for 500 miles. And then south of that, <clears throat> there were some American settlements along the, the coast in Natchez and, and New Orleans. But settlers called that area the wilderness because it was sparsely settled by the Chickasaw and Choctaw area. So if you were traveling south in, in, um, in the continent, uh, this was actually the west, the wild west at the time, uh, and came to Franklin, you were virtually on the edge of the, of the American frontier. And the cause of that, uh, trade developed between Franklin and Natchez to the south. There was an old Indian trail we know today as the Natchez Trace uh, from Natchez to Nashville or Nashville to Natchez, depending on where you live. Natchez tries to say that everybody started in Natchez and came north. And people in Nashville said just the opposite. Uh, but, but in uh, 1793, Chickasaw Chief Piamingo made a proposal to the settlement in uh, Nashville called the Cumberland Settlement that they clear out a new road or a new path between the Cumberland Settlement and the Chickasaw Nation capital, which was then close to where Tupelo is today. And, and Robert, James Robertson agreed. And that path became what we know today, as, known as what today is the Natchez Trace. Before then, the old Chickasaw Trace went west to what we know as Dixon, and from there went south to the Chickasaw Nation. So the, what we know today as the Natchez Trace was actually at that time called the Piamingo Trace or the Mountain Leaders Trace that was established in 1793. And it was a rough Indian trail, uh, pretty much a footpath. There was some horse uh, transportation on it, uh, but it, it would not accommodate wagons, although they were pretty much the all-terrain vehicle of the time. It was not a wagon road. And so when President Jefferson became president in 1801, uh, he and the Army realized that we had to have a wagon road to get the troops and the settlers from this area down through what the settlers call the wilderness to New Orleans. 
because New Orleans, he said, was the key. In 1802, uh, he wrote a letter to Robert Livingston which he said that, that New Orleans would control the future of this continent because whoever controlled New Orleans controlled all of the river traffic on the Mississippi River where all of our goods flowed and where the people would eventually settle. And if the British were ever able to capture New Orleans, they would control the American continent. And Jefferson was intent on getting New Orleans in order to be able to finally get the far west. And that was one of the reasons Jefferson decided to turn the uh, Natchez Trace Indian Trail into a wagon road. They were so anxious to do it in 1802 because Napoleon indicated he would be retroceding or taking back uh, the French area around New Orleans from Spain. You know, Spain had attempted to give it to us during the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, around the same time they were having negotiations and Napoleon indicated he would not recognize that and Jefferson was concerned about whether or not he would have to deal with Napoleon on the southern border. And so uh, even before the Americans had the treaty with the Chickasaw and Choctaw to build the Natchez Road, they were so anxious to start that in 1801 the Army sent troops here to Williamson County to begin building the Natchez Trace Wagon Road uh, from about Leaper's Fork down to the Tennessee Valley Divide, where, which was the northern boundary of the Chickasaw Nation at the time. What's significant about that road is, at the time, the federal government did not build highways. Or they had only the authority under the Constitution to build highways for postal roads. And Jack, Jack Jefferson called it a postal road, but he really needed a military road. So the Natchez Trace Military Highway, or Military Road, in essence was the first federally improved highway in the United States. There are other older roads, but none improved by the federal government. The National Road claims to be the first American road, but if you look, and it was cleared by George Washington a few years early, but if you look at when the improvements on the National Road were made, it was after work had started on the Natchez Trace. So I think we have a good argument here that Williamson County has remnants of the first federal highway in the United States, which at the time they called the Columbian Highway. And they, they said that the highway had to be cleared 12 feet wide, wide enough for wagons to pass. And when they approached a stream, if the stream was wider than 40 feet, it had to be bridged. If it was narrower, they had to build ramps for wagons to go down into the stream. Uh, across the Duck River and the, and the Tennessee River, because they were so wide, they actually created ferries for the ferry, uh, the traffic across. And so it was, it was a pretty large enterprise for the federal government at the time. But Jefferson had that vision and he anticipated we would need someday to be able to send the troops uh, south to New Orleans to defend the continent. And as we know during the War of 1812, he, he was right. Um, Franklin at the time uh, was surprisingly to some travelers a well-heeled town. Uh, it had been formed in 1799. Um, and by 1812 they had some brick buildings, had a log courthouse so the center of the square where the soldiers monument is now was where the log courthouse was in 1812. Gurdon Squires had built a big brick commissary where they sold all kinds of goods from Philadelphia and New Orleans. And people are often amazed that uh, they could buy just about anything in Franklin at that time that you could buy anywhere else. Uh, because they did have good traffic from Philadelphia and from New Orleans through this area. Some travelers were surprised that uh, people bathed in Franklin at the time and that they dressed up in their finest on Sundays to go to church. And so those were, th those were considered two uh, earmarks of um, of a good civilized society at the time. Um, but Franklin it was in some ways on par with Nashville at the time. Nashville wasn't much more developed. It was a little bit larger, but not much more developed than Franklin. Um, and so because of that, Franklin was the largest city or town or settlement on the Natchez Trace between Nashville and Natchez. And because of that, traffic developed between the two. Um, traffic, uh, if, if they raised sheep or hogs or cattle anywhere between here and Natchez, they often uh, brought them up the Natchez Trace to sell in Franklin. If there were any uh, civil disturbances or any crimes committed on the Natchez Trace, they often brought the people into Nash Franklin or, or Nashville to try. Uh, and so Na Franklin played a very important role in this area on the edge of the frontier, which was important during the War of 1812. Um, Think about being here on the edge of the frontier and south is the Chickasaw Territory, south is the Choctaw Territory. There are still creeks down in lower Alabama. And just 20 years before, the small number of people who lived in the Cumberland Settlement were still hiding out in their fort. Uh, they were being attacked uh, almost every day by Creek and Shawnee Indians. Uh, 
Uh, they said a settler at that time was killed about, one settler in every 10 days was killed in Tennessee. And that was what many of the people who lived here in 1812 had grown up with. And they were afraid of, of the American Indians. Although Chickasaws and Choctaws had often been friendly, they were, they were afraid what would happen if they got together and decided to rebel against the settlements here. And, uh, Chickas and um, Shawnee Chief Tecumseh fed that fear in 1811. Uh, Tecumseh saw what was happening up in the Wabash area, how the, the new roads were coming in, settlers were following them. That was part of the plan to occupy the area. And then the troops would come in and they would take over the area and push the Indians out. And Tecumseh said, you know, if the, if the Indian nations did not join together and push the, push the Americans out, they would, they would lose their land. Tecumseh was right. And so he saw also that the, the British and the French were tied down. He thought there would be a way of maybe tying down the Americans as part of that, and this was his opportunity to strike. And so in the fall of 1811, Tecumseh went south and went down through the Natchez Trace, and he met with the Chickasaw, he met with the Choctaw, he met with the Creeks, and he, he implored them to join together, to use this opportunity to um, attack the Americans, push them back out to the sea where they came from, and reclaim their land. And he made a very passionate speech at Colbert Ferry and, and talk of uh, Chickasaw there. And that they were on friendly terms with the Americans. They, they rebuffed him. They sent him on his way, sent him down to the Choctaw area. They also rebuffed him. Uh, Choctaw leader Pushmahata spoke up against him and said the Americans had always been their friend. They had never killed a white man and they would not start now. And everywhere Tecumseh went to give his talks, Pushmahata would follow him and give his rebuttal. And finally, Pushmahata, and then finally Tecumseh went to the Creek Nation. And there he found that the Creeks were in a civil war. There were some Creeks who wanted to follow the old traditions of their ancestors. There were some Creeks who wanted to, uh, to change their customs to get along with the white man because it was more uh, profitable for them to do that. And they saw what the future was. And so they found that civil war and Tecumseh took advantage of that. And he really appealed to these young uh, Creeks that became known as the Red Stick Faction and encouraged them to honor their ancestors by joining together, joining him, and attacking the Americans. And so there was a small group of Creeks that followed Tecumseh back up into the Wabash. And even after Tecumseh was killed in battle there, they came back through Tennessee and uh, thought that the appropriate thing to do was to attack every white person they saw. They attacked a group of settlers on the uh, Duck River in what is now Humphreys County, um, and then attacked another group farther south. They, they found a young woman, they, they kept her alive from that settlement. Her name was Martha Crawley. And uh, they decided they were going to try to use her as a prisoner somehow to obtain an advantage over the Americans. And so they forced her to, to walk behind them on the way back. Uh, and then wild stories followed that they were, um, they had stripped her naked, they were forcing her to dance in front of the warriors, uh, committing all kinds of depredations on her. And the stories, every time they were told, they would just get wilder and wilder and wilder. That got people in an uproar. And they said, this is, it's, Tecumseh's war is starting. And we need to be prepared to go to war against the Creeks. Well, one person in particular took advantage of that. His name was Andrew Jackson. And Jackson had worked for about 12 years to rise through the ranks of the Tennessee militia, which was a power structure in Tennessee at the time. And um, Jackson saw this as an opportunity, really, to pull the the Tennesseans together to pull the rest of the Americans together and to go to war against the Creeks and resolve that threat once and for all. Jackson later admitted he did certain things to try to rouse the people up to get them to go to war. Um, Jackson had a good friend, uh, Mr. Bradford, who owned the Tennessee newspaper in uh, Nashville, Tennessee Gazette, and Bradford began to publish a series of articles. Uh, some were uh, British intrigue. Every week you would see British intrigue, the terrible things the British were doing. And then there was another column about the Indian depredations. So you, every week you would see the British intrigue, the Indian depredations, and pretty soon people began to connect the two. The British were working together with the Indians to cause them to uh, formulate plans to attack the Americans. And it was just any day they expected news that the Creeks were uh, rebelling uh, against the Americans. So you may have heard the old saying, uh, good Lord willing and the creeks don't rise, I will be there. That's, that's an old saying from Tennessee. And we always thought that meant the, the river streams, but it means the creek Indians. Good Lord willing, the creeks Indians don't rise, I will be there. Because people lived every day thinking any day the creeks are going to rise up against us. Well, there were some young men in Huntsville who were in a general store. 
and Huntsville was on the far reaches of the American settlement down in Alabama, and they saw a group of Indians go in and buy rounds of ammunition. And the settlers began to talk about, what does that mean? That, might, that means they must be getting ready to attack us. And so the young men thought they would have some fun, and they, they went out that night, they painted themselves as Creek Indians, they, they stripped themselves, put the red ochre paint on them, and they began making the sounds of the war cries of the, of the Creeks. And they started throwing rocks on the, on the uh, roof of the cabin. Well, that had the intended effect. People thought the Creeks were rising up. They fled their cabins, ran, ran for their lives. They, they put everything they could, they could carry in their wagons and started north. And one young man described seeing hundreds of wagons, one after the other, going north because of this one little incident of these young men thinking they would have a good time. Well, by the time that story got to Columbia, uh, the Creeks, the supposed Creeks, had grown in number to 2,000. There were 2,000 Creeks on the Indian border rising up, attacking Huntsville. They were burning Huntsville. They were coming in our direction. By the time the story got to Franklin, there were 3,000. 3,000 Creeks have, have risen up, and they're getting ready to attack, and they're on the border of Tennessee. They're coming up this way. We've got to be prepared. And so everyone called out the militia uh, to get ready to attack the Creeks because this was war. And, and finally, when a, when a militia officer handed Andrew Jackson a letter certifying that 2,000 Creeks were on their way, Jackson called out the militia. Uh, cooler heads said, maybe we need to verify this before we go attack the Creeks. Jackson paused one day, and that one day was sufficient to prove that it was all just a hoax. There were no Creeks getting ready to attack, and so the militia calmed down. Um, but without any embarrassment at all, the Nashville newspaper reported the incident and said, this just proves that we are willing to attack at a moment's notice uh, to, take, to defend our territory against the Creeks. Be, be prepared. This is coming. So imagine the settlers, they, they had dealt with the Indians before, but suddenly everything changed. And th those on the border of the Tennessee settlements looked across the Tennessee River. They heard dogs barking. Well, they heard dogs barking every day. They'd been there, but somehow this time it sounded menacing or they heard Indians' war cries, and they'd heard those before, but this time it sounded different. So they were on edge. They were, they were ready for something to happen. And so when the Martha Crawley incident happened, they thought that was the proof we needed. We needed to go to war. And so the Tennesseans appealed to their representatives in Congress, and they became known as the War Hawks, and they said, time, the time has come to go to war. If we don't do something now, we're going to be wiped out, and, and people in Washington don't care to defend us. They're tied up in other areas. We need to go to war now. And so in January or in June um, 1812, President, President Madison declared war against Britain. And Andrew Jackson thought any moment he was going to get word that he would be selected to lead this expedition going down to, to Natchez to defend the, the nation. Jackson had an enemy, uh, had several actually in Washington, who did not want him to lead this expedition. And so they hesitated, they paused. They, they gave Governor Blunt at the time uh, an opportunity to appoint someone other than Andrew Jackson as, as the leader of this. Thomas Jefferson had been told that Andrew Jackson was a wild man. He could not be, uh, he could not be um, uh, counted on when the time came to follow orders. Jackson had given him reason to think uh, that maybe that was the case. And so they, they hesitated appointing Andrew Jackson. But Jackson had enough influence over his good friend, Willie Blunt, who was governor, that eventually Jackson was appointed to lead the Tennessee militia. So in November, 1812, Word went out to um, all the Tennesseans that we need 1,500 volunteers in rendezvous in Nashville December 10th, 1812, and be prepared to march south to New Orleans to defend, uh, defend our nation against a British attack. Well, December, 12th, December 10th, 1812 came, and it was the coldest day in memory. There was a nor'easter, and it started snowing about 9 in the morning, and by 4 p.m. there was a foot of snow on the ground the day that Tennesseans had been called to come into Nashville to rendezvous. But despite that blizzard, not only 1,500 soldiers came, 2,000 men came to Nashville to answer the call to arms. And so from that day forward, Tennessee has been known as the volunteer state. Uh, now there were similar numbers that turned out later on in Kentucky, but uh, Tennessee got the, the reputation for being known as the volunteer state from that, that one incident. It was confirmed during the Mexican War as well. But that's, that's where that came from in 1812. Uh, Jackson assembled his soldiers there. He got them ready to go to, 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 go to fight. Um, Jackson was young and inexperienced. He, he had no doubt that within two or three months training, he could take these citizen soldiers, these volunteers, and turn them in into an army that could defeat the mighty British who had thousands of soldiers who had been fighting Napoleon for years. Um, he, he was not a, a wilting flower. You know, he, he thought he could, 
do whatever needed to be done to attack the British. Uh, but Jackson, again, had enemies in Washington. And very soon it became apparent the arms that Jackson had been promised did not arrive for the men. The money that Jackson needed to uh, bring the men in as, as actual militiamen to pay them in advance for their services, that money did not arrive. And he had to wait there in Nashville and wait and wait uh, for the army to, to, to finally say, okay, now the time has come, we're going to give you the provisions that you need. Well, Jackson got tired of waiting, and so he appealed to a couple of his friends who were bankers in Nashville to lend the state the money they needed to pay the soldiers to march south. And his friends, uh, uh, James Jackson and Washington Jackson, no relation, uh, agreed that the Bank of Nashville would um, execute a note for people, all the citizens of Nashville to sign uh, to, to pay the men to go south on the, on the Natchez Trace to defend the country. And so Jackson was ready, except he still didn't have the arms, and he decided that he would not wait on the arms, he would, he would go ahead and leave Nashville hoping the arms would, would arrive later on. Uh, he had originally planned to take all of the troops, as, Jack, as Jefferson had envisioned, down the Natchez Trace, but because the weather was so bad and the freezing and the thawing of the roads would not uh, allow the wagons to hold up, he decided to divide his troops. And so he, he took the men who were the, on the infantry that, who were on foot, and he decided to send them down the Mississippi River on flatboats. And the men who were in the cavalry, 670 officers under his business partner, John Coffey, would go down the Natchez Trace. And so January 9th, they, they set out from Nashville, uh, 33 flatboats took the infantry th 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 on the Cumberland River up the Ohio with all of the ice barges, uh, the ice flows, and then down the Mississippi River. And Coffey set off down the Natchez Trace first to Franklin. He arrived here January 18th. He allowed three days for the soldiers uh, to have their last opportunity with civilization, as they called it at the time. Uh, and they took that time to get ready. They, the officers uh, and the cavalry had been able to bring their own firearms. That was one of the requirements for being a cavalry officer. You had to have your own firearms. And Franklin just happened to have two very fine gunsmiths, the Crockett brothers, who had a store, I understand, from Rick Warwick, where the, the old courthouse is now, the brick courthouse, was where the, the Crockett uh, gunsmith shop was. And so one of the first orders was to take all the rifles, to take all of the ammunition, and let's gather together and make sure it's in good working order. Uh, because we're getting ready to head into Indian territory, and though the Chickasaws and Choctaws have always been friendly to us, we don't know what kind of reception we're going to have. They may have gotten together, and they may plan to plot against us. That was the, they were under orders, very strict orders, to be prepared to be attacked by the Indians. And they also laid in provisions of bacon and, and flour that they would need for the food that they, they would have. Now, they knew that they did not have enough food to, for 600 men to go 500 miles on the Natchez Trace. You know, it takes about a ton of food for the men a day. It takes even more for their horses. But they thought they would have, be able to carry enough to get to the Tennessee River. And from that point south, they had arranged for government contractors to lay out provisions at certain points. So they would, they would march so many miles a day, and they would find these provisions of food that they would need. So they set off from Franklin about uh, January 20th, going south first through Columbia, then on the Natchez Trace, uh, Dobbin Stand, down in what is now Lewis County, and then on the old Natchez Trace. Well, they got to the Tennessee River, thinking that they were, of course, entering Indian Territory, and as they got ready to cross, the men were vulnerable as they were, went across the river. It took almost a couple of days for them by ferry to go across the river. And, um, John Coffey worried about that. So he told the men, as you get on the south side of the river, set your tent so that they line up in a straight line. And when I saw that the first time, I couldn't understand why that was. But then I realized any Creek Indians coming down the river seeing a long line of tents would assume there was breadth to that camp. And there were lots of soldiers on the, on the hillside. So that was a defensive move uh, to make the, make the Creeks think that the army was a lot larger than it was. It turns out the Creeks were not anywhere close to them. They didn't have that problem. But they still worried about what effect uh, the, that Tecumseh might have had on the Chickasaw in the area. Well, the, the infantry hadn't gotten very much farther south, just, just north of the Chickasaw Agency, and they made a very tragic discovery. And that was that the government contractors who were supposed to have provided the food had not performed. So their coffee was 10 days from home to the north, 10 days march from Natchez to the south, 670 men, 670 horses, and no food in the middle of winter. And he panicked, because he knew very likely the horses would die before they got back. That meant some of the men would die, and he would not get his troops down to New Orleans. And he sent runners um, 
express riders going south to Natchez begging for help from the Mississippi territorial governor, governor to send food provisions. Well, Chickasaw Chief George Colbert heard about his predicament, and Colbert had been asked to demonstrate his friendship to the, to the Americans, and this was his opportunity. And so he asked his uh, people to gather together their, government, their, I mean, their uh, winter provisions and to provide it to the soldiers who were marching through their nation, and they did. Now, this was not a small sacrifice because whatever they had gathered together for the winter had to manage their needs for the whole winter. Hunting had been depleted in the area at the time, and they only had a small amount of food to last through the winter, but they shared that food with the American soldiers coming through their area, and because of the Chickasaw's actions, the soldiers actually survived and lived uh, to reach Natchez. And, but they learned that they could rely on the Chickasaw Nation. The Chickasaws then became partners in this effort. They went on south into the Choctaw area. The Choctaws were equally as friendly and provided for them as well. Amazingly, the Jackson soldiers on the flatboats arrived in Natchez almost exactly the same day that Coffee's men came down the Natchez Trace. Um, on the way down, Jackson's enemy, General James Wilkinson, uh, began working his plots. Now, whether Wilkinson actually was the one who arranged for the funds not to arrive, for the weapons not to arrive, no one knows. Uh, at one point on the flatboats on the Cumberland River, uh, Jackson did find provisions of food, but he, when he opened the, opened the crates, he found that the pork had been stuffed together with um, pig skulls and uh, all kinds of things that would have made the pork go bad. Was that Wilkinson? You know, we'll, we'll never know. But Wilkinson began riding to Washington, and during this time, he arranged for someone from the War Department to write a letter, or Wilkinson may have written it himself, <coughs> telling Jackson to disband his troops. Um, that letter would not arrive until a couple of months later in Natchez. Wilkinson held on to that, that letter until Jackson arrived. But Wilkinson also began sending letters to Jackson on the way down saying, there are not enough provisions for you at New Orleans. You need to halt your advance in Natchez at Fort Dearborn. There's plenty of room for you there. You'll find everything you need stop in Natchez. So Jackson had to make a decision. Did he trust his enemy Wilkinson uh, with this advice or did he disobey Wilkinson's order? Wilkinson was in control of, of the Gulf Coast and go to New Orleans anyway. Jackson decided he would trust Wilkinson. He would stop at New Orleans. It was probably the greatest mistake Jackson ever made in his life. When the soldiers got to Fort Dearborn, well, Wil Wilkinson uh, promised them they would find adequate provisions. He discovered that the old fort was dilapidated. Uh, the trees had been cut within miles, so any soldiers wanting to build fires would have to walk miles to bring in trees. The spring that was there to feed the fort, they had built latrines over the, the spring that was to serve as the water supply. And then worst of all, Jackson said, he looked out and there were 800 graves of soldiers who had died under Wilkinson's command. And those graves were also over the spring that was to provide water uh, for, for the, the soldiers. And Jackson knew that he had been, he had, been had. Worst of all, the, the guns that were to be there, the ammunition that was to be there for Jackson when he arrived at Natchez wasn't there. And so Jackson had no way to utilize his troops for any kind of defense. And so rather than taking over command of the Gulf Coast from Wilkinson, Jackson had to sit down in his tent and write a letter begging Wilkinson for just basic provisions just to survive. And I'm sure it was a humiliating moment for Andrew Jackson, who was a very proud man, to have to beg his enemy for that kind of help. Jackson immediately took matters into his own hands. He moved his troops from Fort Dearborn about two miles to the west uh, to the Perkins farm where there were adequate springs, there was room to exercise, and he began making his own plans to uh, take matters into his own hands to keep his troops alive and, and to get them on to New Orleans wherever he would be needed. And he began writing his own letters to the War Department asking for help. Well, the 1st of March, Wilkinson had the letter delivered to Jackson saying, dismiss your men. Turn over all your equipment, all your provisions to General Wilkinson. Thank you for your service. Well, the problem was Jackson was there 500 miles from home with 2,000 young men from Tennessee. 150 of them were already sick. 50 of them were so sick they couldn't even walk. He had no money for food, no money for transportation, no way to get them back home. And he was told even to turn over the tents the men had for shelter to General Wilkinson and get his men back home the best way he could what was Jackson to do? He had, he had a great decision to make. Here was an order from the War Department from Washington telling him to abandon his men. And then he looked out at the 2,000 men he had led on the Natchez Trace. And these were young boys, some of them as young as 12 years old. These were the sons of his friends. And he had promised these young men he would be as a father to them. He would protect them. He, 
and they could trust him. And it was, it was the greatest decision probably any commander has ever had to make, that Andrew Jackson had to make. And so he finally made his decision. He said, I led you into the field, I will lead you home. That meant he was disobeying an order, direct order from the War Department. It did help him to know, when he looked at the, the order, it was dated January 6th from uh, Secretary of War Armstrong. Secretary of War Armstrong did not take office until February. So immediately he suspected that it was a forgery. And he said, Wilkinson, of course, was known for his forgeries. And he says, the gauze is too thin to hide the forgery. This is a Wilkinson forgery. And he immediately began firing off letters to the War Department, saying that what Wilkinson is doing to him, asking for help to get his men home. He begs the local um, uh, Army quartermaster for food. They, they reject his request. He begs for medicine for his men. They reject his request. He begs for wagons to get his men back home. They reject his request. And so finally, Jackson again turns to a couple of friends, Washington Jackson and James Jackson, who are also bankers in Natchez. And he asks to borrow the funds for a small amount of food, a small amount of medicine, uh, to take care of his men to get them back home. And they agree. And the local story there is that one of the Jackson brothers actually supplied a thousand pairs of boots because the men had worn out their boots to get the men back home. But Jackson still needed wagons, and the Army refused to provide them. So finally he came up with a plan, and he wrote the quartermaster, and he said, well, General Wilkinson wants these tents. If you'll bring the wagons out to the camp on a certain day at a certain time, you can pick up the tents. You need to bring about 11 wagons. But, so the Army fell for it. They brought 11 wagons out to the camp, and when they did, Jackson seized those, camp, those wagons from the Army. And he told his men that if any of, if any of the Army uh, soldiers that were there attempted to recruit his soldiers, they were to be arrested and thrown out of camp. Now imagine a general doing that today. He was obviously disobeying an order, and he was stealing 11 wagons from the U.S. Army. He was taking a risk. It was a, probably the biggest risk he took in his life. But he knew that the future of his men depended on it, his future depended on it, of this, of this working. His plan was to be able to get his men far, back, far enough back north on the Natchez Trace that the gov Tennessee Governor Blunt would get word that they were coming south and that he would send wagons, he would send food and all the provisions he needed to get back. It, he, had, he had risked, he had plotted out the, the amount of time it would take, he had risked that he would be able to get the men back fast enough in order for the food to reach them in time. So the 1st of March, uh, 21st of March, the men start back up the Natchez Trace. Very first day, so many men begin falling sick, they have to stop and set up an emergency camp. The food that was provided was bad, and the man got sick from the food and they had to set up an emergency camp. So he knew they were already getting off onto a bad, bad start. Two or three days later, so many of the men also began falling sick. They realized the plan was not going to work. They needed every horse that they had so for the sick men to ride the horses. So Jackson asked all the commanders to give up their horse, and of course, asking them to give up their horses, he had to give up his own horse. So Jackson got off of his own horse, and from that point forward, he walked every step that the soldiers walked back up the Natchez Trace with them. Some days they walked into mud up to their ankles. Some days they walked into swamps up to their waist. This was in early spring, late winter. And for Jackson, an old man who was already sick at the time, it was a struggle. Now the story is that some of the soldiers on the way back looked at Jackson and one of them said, look at that old man, he's tough. And one of them said, he's as tough as hickory bark. And they began calling him Old Hickory. Now that's the story that's been told. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But that, that is the story that was told, and none of the soldiers who were with Jackson ever said that wasn't, wasn't true when he used that to become president later on. Well, he got back as far north as the, as the uh, Choctaw Agency where the provisions were to have been sent, and he got a letter from Nashville by express rider. Governor Blunt said that he had no authority to give Jackson any food, any provisions. And there Jackson was without any additional help to get his men back home, and he was furious. He said, you're the ones who called the men out here to serve they are here at your command, and you're going to just leave them to the vultures of the wilderness. You're going to leave them to die. Uh, but Jackson was determined he was going to get his men home. And again, he turned to the Chickasaw for help to, get, to give him food. And they provided food that he needed to get his men back to Tennessee. When the word arrived, when the cavalry came back first, uh, they got the horses back as quickly as they could. And the word arrived that the young men were on their way back up the Natchez Trace, and they were hungry. They didn't have food. The men were getting sick. The parents got together. And they gathered up horses, uh, they gathered up food and provisions. Uh, someone passed a note around Nashville and they got enough signatures to raise 
to buy food in Columbia, and they sent the wagons down the Natchez Trace to meet the men, and they got the, they got the soldiers back home. Jackson comes back to Nashville, and there's supposed to be a, a ceremony in Nashville on his way back. Governor Blunt, who had, who had denied his, his request for provisions, was uh, officiating the ceremony. And so the newspaper called it a pleasant little, cer pleasant little ceremonial, as opposed to the big send-off Jackson had gotten when he left Nashville. Um, Governor Blunt presented Jackson a flag sewn by the ladies of East Knoxville, and as he handed Jackson the flag, he said, I want you to know that you, with this flag, you will know that you can always count on the support of the citizens of the state of Tennessee. And I, I've said this before, those of you who heard me say, I think the fact that Jackson did not pull his pistol out and shoot the governor at that moment shows just how much he had grown on the Natchez expedition. The men came back devastated. They had not faced an enemy. Uh, they had been embarrassed. They came back in tatters, starving to death, emaciated, uh, not, not the victors they had imagined when they left. They were already upset with the federal government, and it could have been a disaster for the United States, except the men said they were loyal to their general. And if he called them to together again, to rendezvous again, they would. Um, and Jackson, uh, just a few months later, after fighting a duel with Thomas Hart Benton, which is another, a long story, in Nashville, um, got up off of his deathbed after being shot by one of the Benton brothers when he heard that the Creeks were getting ready to attack and he ordered the soldiers together, together again in, in uh, Fayetteville to rendezvous to go fight the Creeks. So Jackson put on his uniform, the men went to, to Fayetteville, and then Jackson engaged in the Creek Wars um, and eventually defeated the Creek Nation. And because of that, you know, the United States now has much of Georgia and Alabama as a, as a result of the treaty that was eventually signed. As Jackson was down in the lower area of Alabama, he got word that the British were arming the Indians from Pensacola. And so he, he broke the, the law, he broke his orders again, and sent soldiers into Pensacola to find out if this was true or not. John Gordon, who had an inn on the old Natchez Trace, just south of here in the Duck River, uh, was sent as the sole spy. He came back and he confirmed, and in fact, the British and the Spanish were arming the Indians. So Jackson attacked Pensacola and, um, and, wiped, and forced the British off of Pensacola uh, and then pulled his troops back. While they were there, they got word that the British were sending 15,000, some say 12, some say 15, of their finest soldiers to the, to the United States to attack. They had just defeated Napoleon. They could now uh, focus their entire attention on defeating the United States. And so Jackson looked around. He had about 4,000 men, and he realized he was in trouble. And so he sent express riders back to Nashville, asking them to, we need 5,000 men as quickly as possible from Tennessee. We need 5,000 men from Kentucky. Send them as quickly as possible. Don't wait until they're all assembled. As soon as you get a, a small company, go ahead and send those down the Natchez Trace. And he, he, he uh, designated certain points on the Natchez Trace where the riders were to report that the troops had arrived, so he would know exactly where the troops were. Jackson kind of planned a three-prong attack. The soldiers from Kentucky were to go down Mississippi River in flatboats. The soldiers from Tennessee were to go down the Natchez Trace the middle Tennessee, and the soldiers from East Tennessee were to go down the federal road through Georgia. So depending on where the British attacked, he would have men prepared to be ready to defend the Gulf Coast. And so um, Jackson's men who came back were with him on the Natchez expedition. They remembered how they almost starved to death the first time. They didn't want to do that again. So they disobeyed Jackson's order, and they split up the men. And they, they told him they were sending most of the men down the Mississippi River but just because he had ordered men to go down the Natchez Trace, they were sending the rest of the men overland down the Natchez Trace. And those men arrived in December 1814, just in time for the Battle of New Orleans. Battle of New Orleans was a great victory for the Americans, for Jackson. Uh, that, that too is another story as to how he positioned the British into, a, into a, almost a bottleneck where he had the, advan the advantage. And so when the British uh, uh, came into the battlefield, they were pretty much sitting ducks. And, um, and Jackson mowed them down. And it, it was one of the most lopsided uh, defeats from what I've been told um, in military history. So the Tennessee soldiers who in 1814 and 1812 or 1813 came back um, in, in tatters and rags and, and despondent came back as victors this time. And Andrew Jackson who had to walk back up the Natchez Trace in 1813, uh, which is a, a sign of shame for a, a warrior, certainly to the Indians, came back in 1815 as a victor. And this time, uh, one of the men who lived at, out at Leaper's Fork, uh, 
describes seeing a carriage and seeing soldiers marching in front and soldiers marching behind, almost like the current Secret Service, giving Jackson an escort all the way up the Natchez Trace. And all the way up the Trace, when he came to settlements, they uh, held victory balls and for him. He was the great victor of the, of the War of 1812. And when he came back to Nashville, there was a grand celebration. And it says that when he came to Franklin, they also held a ball for him. They held a, a, a banquet for him. And Jackson rewarded the citizens of Franklin with a brass cannon that he had recovered, probably at Pensacola, uh, as a present uh, for their, their help during the war. Uh, as a side note, that cannon disappeared during the war for Mexican independence, and they said it was used in the Battle of San Jacinto. I suspect Sam Houston probably commandeered that cannon on his way down, but we'll probably never be able to prove it. It never, never showed up again, uh, but it was from the War of 1812. And so because of this, you know, if you, if you compare 1812 and 1815, I think it was Jackson's experience in 1812 that really made him the man that he was to be able to defeat the British in, in 18, 1815. If he had encountered the British as young and inexperienced with no military training um, in 1813, it, we might have had a different result. But because of the terrible experience and the, and the challenges he faced on the Natchez Trace, uh, he, was, he was a commander and he had the respect of his men and he was able then to defeat the British in battle. So Franklin played a very important role uh, in, the, in the War of 1812 because of its position here. It supplied troops, it supplied ammunition, it supplied um, food throughout the war. Uh, it was a place where some of the war uh, efforts were planned and it, now that we have the bicentennial, it's a good opportunity for Franklin uh, to recognize its role in, in the War of 1812. So to wind this up, something a little different tonight. Uh, we have a new site on the Natchez Trace that we've designated as the War of 1812 Memorial Site. And there was a monument that we dedicated during the Bicentennial uh, in June. The Daughters of 1812 dedicated a monument to all the soldiers who marched on the Natchez Trace and especially the soldiers who died on the Natchez Trace. And doing some research about the, the creation of the Natchez Trace Parkway, we found out that one of the main reasons it was created to be a national park was to remember the role that Andrew Jackson and the soldiers played during the War of 1812. It is a War of 1812 National Park, and people have forgotten that over the years. And so in Williamson County now, we have the War of 1812 Memorial Site, also honoring the men who died on the Natchez Trace during the war. A lot of the men died from sickness, and they're buried in, in unmarked graves along the old Natchez Trace. And so the old Natchez Trace is actually a War of 1812 uh, cemetery. And so this monument here honors those men. The Natchez Trace Parkway Association is working to improve the interpretation along the Natchez Trace Parkway. And so we've created a cell phone tour. We're working on that. And the War of 1812 site is the first site that we have designated for the cell phone tour. So tonight, if you would like to see this, uh, we have about five short clips of the cell phone tour. You'll be the first audience to see that. You can be the test audience to say what you like and what you don't like. Uh, but up until now, if you go to a site on the Natchez Trace Parkway, most likely, you'll just see a, a sign with a, a small paragraph saying, 200 years ago, something really important happened on this piece of ground. And for young people, that's not very exciting anymore. They're used to all of the bells and whistles of their, their cell phone. So now they'll be able to pull out their cell phone and they'll be able to see what you're getting ready to see in just a moment and tell me what you think about it, okay? All right, let's see if we can pull this up. And this is our website, by the way, natchestrace.org, where you can See this on your own if you like. Let me just unroll it here. I think about five of these clips. The War of 1812 Memorial Site honors the role of the Natchez Trace during what is sometimes called the United States Second War of Independence, the War of 1812. The Natchez Trace played an important role in the war from 1813 to its end in 1815. The monument in the center was placed by the U.S. Daughters of 1812 on the bicentennial of the Declaration of War. It is dedicated to the soldiers who marched on the Natchez Trace during the war, and particularly those who died on the Natchez Trace. As volunteer militia, soldiers left their homes to rendezvous in freezing winter conditions and march off to battle, not knowing when or if they would return. Many soldiers were in their late teens or early twenties, but some were as young as twelve. A section of the old Natchez Trace where they marched is still visible just to the east of the monument. As troops pass by this point, 
on the marches south. They had just departed the last town on the Natchez Trace for the next 500 miles until they reached the capital of the Mississippi Territory near Natchez. Ahead lay the sparsely populated Chickasaw and Choctaw nations, settlers called the Wilderness. While recruiting militia in 1812, Colonel Henderson told his men, We shall conduct ourselves as gentlemen as well as soldiers, so that if we fall, our fall will be glorious, and if we live to return, let it be with laurels on our brows. Walk out to the section of the old trace where the soldiers marched, and imagine setting off on a 500-mile march into unknown territory as a potential enemy waits at the end of your journey. If you have time while at the site, you may learn more about the war and the marches by selecting additional topics. The United States declared war against Britain on June 18, 1812. Though the War of 1812 has sometimes been called the Forgotten War, during the War of 1812, the White House and the U.S. Capitol were burned, and Francis Scott Key penned the Star-Spangled Banner, which would later become the National Anthem. The Natchez Trace, as a military road, served as an important transportation and supply route for the defense of the Gulf Coast during the war. President Thomas Jefferson ordered the Army to begin development of the Natchez Trace as a wagon road in 1801. Wagons enable the movement of troops by allowing transportation of the large amount of food and supplies needed for operations far from home. During the War of 1812, more than 6,000 soldiers marched along this road in the defense of the Gulf Coast. The road also helped forge the leadership of a future president. General Andrew Jackson's military leadership was first tested on the Natchez Trace, and his endurance in overcoming the challenges on the road earned him the name Old Hickory. Jackson's leadership in the victory over the British at the Battle of New Orleans on January 8, 1815, made him a national military hero and set him on a course that would eventually lead to the White House. Along this road, Jackson and his soldiers made their triumphant return to a grateful nation. Because settlers feared the British were encouraging American Indians to attack, Soldiers did not know whether they would also be attacked by Indians as they marched south through Indian nations. The Chickasaws and Choctaws proved their friendship by providing food and supplies to the troops. Cavalry leader John Coffey wrote to General Jackson on January 28, 1813. I find that all the Indians on the road, and particularly the Colbert family, are all very accommodating to us. We shall be tolerably well supplied in passing through the nation. The soldiers' growing reliance on the Indians strengthened alliances between the U.S. and Chickasaws and Choctaws. Chickasaws and Choctaws had refused to ally themselves with Shawnee Chief Tecumseh and the Red Stick faction of Creek Indians. Therefore, they were threatened with attack by the Red Stick Creek Indians. Chickasaws and Choctaws sought an alliance with American forces to protect their own nations. As Jackson returned from Natchez on the trace in 1813, Chickasaws notified the United States Army that they were ready to go to war with the Creeks, and they requested assistance of U.S. soldiers. In 1814, Chickasaws and Choctaws offered to serve in the Army to help in the defense of their common homeland. Chickasaw men served under Major Uriah Blue to pursue Red Stick Creeks near the Pensacola area. Choctaw men served at the Battle of New Orleans. After winning a victory over the British at New Orleans, most of the American troops in that battle returned on the Natchez Trace, and citizens who lived in the settlements near the road greeted them with victory celebrations. Franklin residents met Andrew Jackson near the Natchez Trace and asked him to give a victory speech. He summed up the results of the war when he said, Our rights will henceforth be respected. The War of 1812 confirmed the independence of the United States. Until the Civil War, Americans celebrated January 8th, the date of the Battle of New Orleans, second only to the 4th of July, as a national holiday. 
points associated with the marches along the Natchez Trace were honored by early Americans. Though the war ended in an essential draw, for Americans it produced a new patriotic spirit, and Andrew Jackson's victory over the British at New Orleans put him on the road to the presidency. This is something we're developing for the Natchez Trace Parkway, and that's just the first site. Uh, we're, the next site is the Meriwether Lewis site, which should be completed hopefully later this year. Um, one of the things that the Natchez Trace Parkway. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, one of the things the Natchez Trace Parkway Association is doing as well. Sorry about that. As doing as well is um, creating living history events. And so for the past three years, we have uh, had reenactors betraying Andrew Jackson and the Tennessee Volunteers in 18, uh, in, not 1811, 2011. Uh, we were down at the Gordon House and we portrayed the, the militia rendezvous, getting ready for war. And then the following year, uh, we started in Natchez uh, with the, 18, the Natchez Expedition. We started in Natchez and came all the way north to the Hermitage and had 22 events in 10 days and met uh, over 2,000 school children. And uh, last year, we were at the Colbert Ferry on the Tennessee River, and we portrayed the Indian Council that was held there among the four tribes. And um, I could actually, if you're interested, I'll show you a clip from that as well. Um, this was the first time these tribes had, had taught or thought about this in, I guess, a couple of hundred, couple hundred years. And Tecumseh was portrayed by uh, Tecumseh's brother's descendant, uh, Gary Hunt, who was uh, the current Piqua Shawnee chief. And um, when, he, when he got word to come, he said, I really didn't want to come, but after this event, I didn't want to go home. Uh, because these tribes talked about this and what it meant to their people uh, from this event. So this is a production uh, by a couple from our area. And they're, they're developing this, they hope, for PBS, um, if they can raise the funding for it. Uh, and they're taking different stories about the Natchez Trace. And they came down to our Living History event in October, or back in, in April, and I'll show this to you. Jean and I just returned from Cherokee, Alabama, where the Natchez Trace Parkway Association staged a reenactment of a little-known event in American history. This gathering would determine the fate of Native Americans in our country, as well as the course of American history. Chickasaw Chief George Colbert had a thriving and lucrative business getting travelers along the Natchez Trace across the Tennessee River for 50 cents, which was two weeks' pay for the average traveler. He was friends with Andrew Jackson and the Americans, and Colbert did not want to risk losing his business. The Shawnee rebel Tecumseh, who had seen tribes like the Pequot and Mohegans disappear at the hands of the Americans in the Northeast, traveled south to meet the chiefs and leaders of the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Cherokee, and Creeks. At the meeting at Colbert's Ferry, Tecumseh brought this message. The annihilation of our race is at hand unless we unite in one common cause against the common foe. After vigorous debate, the Creeks were the only tribe that sided with Tecumseh. The Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Cherokee remained allies of the Americans, which gave Andrew Jackson an unobstructed path to New Orleans to defeat the British. Tecumseh returned home to fight the Americans and lost his life during the War of 1812 in the Battle of the Thames. The Southeastern Indian nations would eventually face Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act of 1830 and the Trail of Tears. So the children who attended this, uh, there were about a thousand kids from Alabama and Tennessee, they left the event saying, this is awesome. And I don't think I've ever heard a young person say, this is awesome about a history lesson before. Um, but the, the teachers said the kids could not stop talking about it, and their parents said the kids could not stop talking about it. So we think this is a very effective way of, of introducing history to young people. Next year, we'll have the anniversary of the victory balls that were given for Jackson. So after the, after the bicentennial celebration in New Orleans in January,
we will start on the Natchez trace uh, beginning in April, April 24th in Natchez, have the victory ball there, then go to Jackson and then Tuscumbia, and we'll end up at the Hermitage on July 4th. And that should be the final event of the War of 1812 bicentennial as far as we know. So I encourage you to participate in that. I would, I would like to see Franklin have uh, an event as well to recreate that victory ball they gave for Andrew Jackson, but we haven't started working on that yet. Any questions? Yes, sir. At the meeting of the Indian nations, was there a language difficulty? And if so, how did they overcome it? Most of them were Muskegee uh, people. Uh, the Shawn when the Shawnee were here, they intermarried with the Creek, who were also Muskegee. And so there was a common um, language. Tecumseh had an interpreter that he brought with him. Uh, so they did have interpreters who would be able to interpret if there was a language barrier. But it's fascinating, they, they debated the question, uh, if the British and the Americans go to war, which side will we take? And to be able to stand on that ground where that decision was made, it really had a lot of consequences for War of 1812 and for our nation, and for their own nations. Where was the Battle of Horseshoe Bend as far as its relationship to Pensacola? It's, it's about an hour north. And I know where it is, it's where okay. we're from, Okay. So that's a big there. I mean, we have reenactments and things there mm -hmm. of that battle. Yeah. But I, I didn't know, was that before Pensacola or after? Uh, before Pensacola. Before Pensacola. Yeah. So it was the first scrimmage, and then they finalized it. Right. Right. I know we're actually from a little town in Alabama called Wisconsin, and there's mm -hmm. a big monument there of where the treaty was signed. Right. With Andrew Jackson. Yeah. Right. And we're working now with the Creek, uh, Porch Creek Nation, and they participated in this. And you know, a lot of them, it, Andrew Jackson is, is kind of a lightning rod in this you know, because of the removal. And it's interesting working with them. Some of them said before this event, you know, they wouldn't even carry $20 bills in their wallet. And, and one, of the, one of the men who's now with the Chickasaw Nation, or, or Creek Nation, said, I was grown up, I, when I grew up, I was taught to hate Andrew Jackson for what he did to my people. But now being part of this event, he said, I have a little different understanding because everything was up for grabs during that period of time. And all the nations were in conflict. Nobody was really sure what was going to happen. Everyone was in a kind of a survival mode. And they began to see Jackson just a little bit different, differently, particularly because of the way that he took care of his own men. I think you're right, because I actually heard that comment that he wasn't very history people in that area was not a kind gentleman. Of right. Yes, sir. This is not directly on the subject, but uh, you know the, kind of the circumstances under which the treaty uh, with the Indian, with Chickasaw, I think it was, Andrew Jackson signed in Franklin in the 1820s. Uh, what, um, was it giving us land or was it some sort of uh, yeah, that was actually supposed to be the treaty in which the Chickasaw ceded the remainder of their land in, uh, in Mississippi. Yeah. And um, Jackson met with them. The Chickasaws were represented by the secretary, uh, John McClish. Uh -huh. And John McClish had had a stand on the Natchez Trace. In fact, he fought under Jackson during the um, War of 1812. And his speech is recorded. It's, it's a very moving speech. You know? He says, uh, we, you know, when you were new to this land, we welcomed you into our homes, we warmed you by our fires, and now it seems odd that it, in our old age we have to leave this land that we know and go to a land that we do not know. But we will, we will do that. And you know, it almost breaks your heart to, to, to read those words and understand how important the land was to them. Uh, but they did sign the treaty here to see the remainder of their land, but, but, it was, but it was conditioned on them finding suitable land out west. And uh, the culprits were very clever people uh, because they had developed this big cotton industry in Alabama at the time. And they delayed uh, the removal as long as possible. And so after the Franklin Treaty, they went out west and they determined they could not find any suitable land uh, except land south of the Red River. And that land was controlled by Mexico. And so they really put the U.S. in a position to say, well, go in and invade Texas and give us our land or we don't have a treaty. And the U.S. government didn't want to do that. So the, the treaty that they signed in Franklin was actually voided. And to this day, the Chickasaws call it the voided treaty. And then later they signed a new treaty a couple of years later. Any other questions? <laughs>
Thank you for coming tonight.